Um, so welcome to today's um, expedition, and it's around ensuring natural assets. So ensuring um, natural assets like coral reefs and mangrove swamps, they are recognized as vital natural assets for the ecosystem services which they provide. For instance, coral reefs are, act as buffers for shorelines against waves, storms, floods. They help pre uh, to prevent loss of life. Sorry, show results. There's something that's just popped on my screen. I just need to, to remove it, thank you. Um, so they help to prevent loss of life. They help to prevent um, um, loss, damage to property. And they also help to prevent erosion of uh, beaches. Um, they also um, depend on, or rather 25% of ocean's fish depend on coral reefs. Um, meaning that they sustain large ecosystems in the ocean. Mangroves, as you all know, capture five to ten, uh, five to ten times of carbon as other land forests, and that's why we consider these to be natural assets. At the same time, these ecosystems are fragile and easily damaged by natural events like extreme weather, pollution, um, and uh, overdevelopment in coastal areas. We are used to seeing how insurance can cover risks in other areas like loss of life or loss of physical assets like houses, machinery, micro assets, um, and even uh, e-commerce deliveries. So can insurance be used to ensure na these natural assets that are so vital to our being? We over the past years have realized that it is actually possible. Um, this is because of an innovative insurance scheme covering the risk of damage to coral reefs um, off the coast of Mexico, which was the world's first. The scheme has attracted widespread interest, including an article on the Wall Street Journal. We will share that in the chat function if you want to refer to it after. And today uh, we will meet the innovator behind this scheme. Fernando is a specialist in coastal resilience and risk at the Nature Conservancy based in Mexico. He was a lead author of the 2019 TNC guide on how to ensure natural assets. And he also led the team that pioneered the concept in Mexico, where the first coral insurance policy paid out in 2020, following the hurricane. Um, yeah. And I must tell you that uh, Fernando has actually come out of his holiday. He's been on holiday, um, uh, visiting the national parks in the US. It's very early his time, but he sacrificed his time to have the conversation that we are having today. So thanks very much, Fernando. And as usual, um, so we'll have other panelists contributing to the conversation, FinTech experts to engage and discuss whether and how this scheme, how schemes like this could be scaled and deployed in Africa. First, we have Jeremy Leach, who's the founder and executive director of Inclusivity Solutions. He's based in Cape Town uh, and Inclusivity Solutions is an insure tech, which offers digital insurance platforms uh, support, uh, supported by open APIs to enable insurers and distribution partners to scale quickly or go to market quickly in Africa. Then we also joined by David Delsa, who is our uh, innovation officer at BFA Global and also the program director of Teka. And he himself is a fintech entrepreneur who thinks constantly about scaling fintech solutions. We will have a round of questions to the first panelists, then an opportunity to engage questions from you. So feel free to chat the questions to us so we can continue to prioritize them as we go along. So Fernando, I'll start with you and I'll start with, uh, let's go to the basics. How did you come up with the idea of ensuring coral reefs in Mexico? Yeah, hello, good morning, or actually good afternoon, or good night, depending where you are. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, coming to your question. As you, as you already said, I mean, the reefs are at risk from many threats, like water pollution, as you mentioned, diseases, that's a bleaching event from climate change, but also hurricanes. And we're going to focus mostly on these ongoing, I would say, threats that we see all the time. But uh, people told us, okay, yeah, the hurricanes can also cause catastrophic events, catastrophic damages to reefs. And so we realized, we, we researched the data to realize how important hurricanes, even that is not, not so frequent, although with climate change, they are more frequent now, 
<laughs> but in the minds of people that occur every 15, 20 years. So why worry about it? And that's an important thing to change your mindset about, okay, we don't have a frequent events, but when they happen, they are catastrophic. So that concept is very important too. We have that discussion with the teams of the reef managers in the area. And then, well, somebody said, well, we need funding to do that. We need, we need some response capacity to actually address those things. But who's going to pay for that? I said, well, why not insure it? I mean, that's precisely the purpose of insurance. That was in 2015, seven years ago, when we realized, well, that's a good idea. But there was a lot of hesitation among the team to do it. But the realization that catastrophic events actually happen and cause severe damages, even if you are working every day in repairing the damages from coral bleaching or diseases, all the work you have been doing can be wiped out by a catastrophic event. So that realization was very important to, do, to decide on that. And then we embark in, on this process because there was already some discussions with Swiss Re uh, about in, insuring things in the natural world. So as well, let's talk to them. And so we made this partnership with Swiss Re and we, we raised the question. So, well, so they help us to actually to pose what are the questions we need to answer to them um, to actually do the science with us. So that was the beginning of this seven years. Thank you. So Fernando, um, it's interesting. So just to recap that last sentence. So you were already in discussions with Swiss Re, so it was about you framing or trying to answer certain questions so that you could together design a suitable solution. Yeah, when we raised the possibility of ensuring a natural asset in this case, the reef, because that's so obvious, hurricanes, we all knew that it's an insurable threat. That's an important thing. You have to have an insurable threat mm -hmm. and not, not against any threat. And they are experts in, in this kind of thing. So, they help us to frame the questions, which I will discuss a little bit later. Thank you so much. And could you describe how the insurance works? It's easy to fathom how car insurance works or property insurance works, but how how does coral reef insurance work? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, so in, we have two types of insurance in the, in the market, I would say. One is the compensation or indemnity insurance. It's depending on how much damages you have, like in your car or in your house, the insurance company will pay you that. So there is an evaluation and they tell you, okay, your damages are worth this amount of money. Or like a medical insurance, you present the bill and this is no? in, in, in reefs is not the case. So, but there is also the parametric insurance, which is already in the market when you decide, for me, the, ECS case is the life insurance. You die, you receive a payout, you show a certification. So there is an event, there is an amount that is agreed previously, and, and then you just notify with a certain document that that event happened. No? So similar thing in, in this case. So um, how does it work in terms of relief? You have to, to decide how much money do we need to for a certain event, I mean, we need hundred thousand dollars, one million dollars. I mean, definitely that's something. So we have to go to the process of defining how much money do we need. Second is what is going to trigger the events. Not any hurricane uh, will have damages, uh, or maybe they pass hundred kilometers away from the reef. So to, to define the area that is going to be covered, that's a second step. And then the the trigger, as we call it, what what is the speed or the intensity of the hurricane? that will trigger that payout. And so we have to do a lot of research about what are the relationship between the hurricane intensity and the damages to the reef and how much will it cost to us to repair those damages, no? So this is called damage score that needs to be built. And so those are the three elements. Again, payout, yes. the polygon, and the intensity of the of the hurricane, which is called the trigger, no? So how does it work? Yeah, whenever you, so we have this, the elements in the in the policy that we um, presented to the, in a competition. So we wanted this amount of money, whatever. So the insurance companies, they, they were so eager to do that. I mean, the, the parametric insurance is already in the market, but has not been applied to, to RIFs. So there was a lot of interest in several um, international companies who offer their services or their quotes, I would say, for that uh, um, policy. Mm -hmm. And that's how it worked in 2021, uh, 20, when the Hurricane Delta hit the area. We had category three, almost uh, 
usually can hit in the polygon where we have the insurance, sorry, the, the ribs, mm -hmm. and they pay out $850,000 to the Quintana Roo government, who, is, who was the buyer of the insurance uh, to support the, the repairs. And another important element that we have to develop in this case was to the response capacity. Who is going to repair the damages? That's a critical element. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, you can have the money, but there is always a need to people. So we had to train brigades of people who are actually divers, who are now experts in doing these repairs. We had to set up a protocol of how to do it, what are the steps. We have to set up a governance who lead the response and, and everything. So in addition to the insurance, which is the financial instruments, we need to have the response capacity in place, which was also a, a, another line of work that is very important to have actually to, to make use of the funding from the insurance. And maybe an additional element is that, yeah, we need the institutional arrangement to actually make this work. I mean, who is going to buy the insurance? Who is going to pay for the insurance? Who is going to receive the funding? Um, so we have to set up all that. We set up a trust fund with the Quintana Roo government, who is collecting the money from different contributions. They bought the insurance, and they are the ones who distribute the funding uh, where it's needed by the time of the event. Great, um, great. So that 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 definitely gives clarity, Fernando. Um, could we get in? Because you mentioned certain players. You mentioned that there was the government that um, received the payout. There was uh, Swiss Re that paid out. There was responders. Could you maybe tell us about all the different parties that um, were responsible for bringing um, this home, bringing the solution home, and what their different roles were? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so in the response side, we have to work with the National Commission of Protected Areas, who are the managers of the reef and the universities who know, who have some experience in, in, in repairing the damages. So that's the first part. To build the response capacity, we work with the national park, the universities to set up the protocol. Second, for the financial instruments or the financial setting is the government of Quintana Roo, the environmental ministry. They were so interested in, in doing this because the economy depends on the tourism who depends on the reefs. So that, that's why the government was so interested in doing this. We also work with the hotel owners association who and properties, and they were so interested in that. They supported, they provided like the lobby for the government to actually do that. Sorry, Fernando, can I uh, just interrupt you for a moment? Your sound has changed. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> that was what happened. <laughs> and so the tell owners. And finally, yeah, in order to design the insurance, uh, yeah, we have the support of Swiss Re uh, at the beginning. At the final stage, we have to hire an insurance expert because Swiss Re wanted to compete. Um, so they, they could not be you know, part of the final design. We had to have an external insurance uh, expert who has been developing parametric insurances in Mexico for many years. And so what the, the final team to, to do that. And obviously we have some lawyers to set up the trust fund and, and so forth. But uh, mainly the universities, the private sector, the hotel owners, the government of Quintana Roo, the Swiss Re company uh, were the main players in, into this. And obviously for us, the funders, I mean, people who were actually funding this process like uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Swiss Re Foundation, um, and other uh, anonymous donors who supported the process because it took several years, as I mentioned, from 2015 to 2019 to develop the concept, to develop all this. Now, next time, it's going to be easier uh, because, yeah, we have so many lessons and we have developed this uh, How to Issue Natural Assets Guide. Thank you. So just to recap, what you mentioned is that you had different stakeholders, ones that would benefit or rather that would be at risk should the event happen. Then you have more like the social good, which is the government, um, they they would lose out in terms of revenues from the hotel owners and then you have an organization like tnc that brings in the expertise um, to facilitate this process along you have the funders uh, because of it being a social good and a new innovation that has not been um, in place to de-risk the process and then you have swiss re and um, coming in to provide the actual solution the insurance solution um 
it would be now that you talked about the process will be easier going forward. Has this been replicated since then? And what learnings as well did you get that others who want to le replicate should consider? Yeah, perfect. Well, it has been replicated now in the Mesoamerican Reef, which uh, uh, is an area that has Mexico, the Mexican Caribbean, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. So another organization, Mar Fund, has purchased the insurance for several reefs along the coast. Um, that's one example. And they already have the response brigades that we have trained and the protocols on those uh, three other countries in addition to Mexico. And that's the full replication. Hawaii has also a bay, a bay which is also similar conditions, uh, potential hurricanes and hotels. And now we that, that's done. The, this is going to be purchased the insurance uh, in the next days. Actually, this July should be in place the insurance over there. So that's the application. In terms of analyzing other options, we are working in the Bahamas also has been severely, severely affected by, by hurricanes and they will cover both uh, reefs and mangroves. In Florida, we are also working to ensure uh, mangroves as well. And then we are going to start a project with the Asian Development Bank in Asia Pacific to cover uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Solomon Islands and Fiji. As potential sites. We have some selected sites over there. And we also began conversation with the Australia Foundation for the Great Barrier Reef Foundation in Australia. And yeah, pretty much those are the most important uh, replications that's happening in the near future. Also, here in the US, uh, where I am now, there has been some conversations with the California and state governments. You know, fires here is, is a big deal. Marshes are also an important things. Ah, and we are working now in two other things: a forest in the lease, yeah. because they they have a they they sold um, carbon credits, so they has a risk that there has a hurricane, destroy the forest, create some fires. So they are thinking also about an insurance for the forest in the lease. And the Baltimore city they has a restoration project of the wetlands in the city that also can be affected by storms. So they are also we are also exploring the. Uh, and insurance for that uh, restoration area in Baltimore. So the interesting thing here is different countries, but also different assets are being uh, considered in this process. This is amazing. Um, so there is a test case outside of Mexico that has gone to other markets, other assets, uh, which is great. So it inspires, I guess, me and um, others that are looking to work into this space. What learnings would you have uh, based on your experiences? What should we look out for? Yeah. Uh, first, I think the developing the guide that you may have seen or you could see has been really uh, a, a way to synthesize the process. And I think there are a few lessons additional to that guide. Uh, we took, as I mentioned, five years to, to get the experience to be able to write the guide. Um, so, but it's very important. Uh, so I will uh, share here my notes. Um, so first is to raise awareness of the risk landscape. I mean, how important is this non-frequent but catastrophic events compared to the ongoing threats that the reef or any other natural asset may have? So that, that's an important realization for the natural asset manager, the, either the hotel owners or the protected area uh, managers, whoever is actually responsible for, for the asset. That's the, the first challenge uh, that we have to have. So we have to have data mm. uh, to show and talk to the people. No? Then um, the process to, to define the, the three elements of the insurance, as I mentioned, the, the payout, the trigger, and the polygon is cumbersome. We would like to see how to streamline that. I mean, we know the steps, but it's a lot of information that needs to be collected. And to actually to define that, we would love to see that that actually you could get into an online platform, put your your parameters, your value values, and then get a quote from from that. No, that's we are still far away from that. But so far, right now, it's so complicated. It takes one year or so to actually to define the parameters for an, for a place. Hmm. So that's a big important challenge. The third challenge will be like in Okay, really defining the country, who buys, who, who pays, who distributes the funding. In the case of the Mesoamerican Reef that I mentioned, it was easy. The institution was already there. They were interested in buying insurance, so quick. In the case of Mexico, it took like a year 
to do the arrangement because it was the government involved, the hotel owners. So sometimes it can be very complicated, like we have in Mexico, and other times can be very easy if you have already the buyer. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, raise the funding to buy the insurance. I mean, who's actually going to pay for that? If we make a big and important economic case that make things maybe easier, but not necessarily completely easy, no? Because yeah, suddenly somebody has to say, okay, I need to save my money in, yeah, not invest it now for the for the potential events. That's always difficult to people, no? <laughs> to save money for that insurance. Um, and that's, that's the final that will be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fernando. Um, I'd like to cross over to Jeremy Leach, um, who has experience in the fintech sector, particularly in tech sector. Um, you have heard about insuring coral reefs in Mexico. As an inclusive tech expert, have you heard of any similar applications in Africa? Uh, thanks, Shirley. Appreciate it. Thank Hi, all. And I have to say at the outset, I'm not an expert in this kind of climate risk, but it's basically it's been in the insurtech space for quite a few years. So I think in terms of kind of Africa, we've seen quite a lot of different experimentation around kind of weather risks and, and such like. Um, and again, the one thing at the outset, I think from what I heard from Fernando, it's a the model of the the you have is perfect for insurance because you're basically saying it's um, infrequent risk, risk, but catastrophic. And that's basically what insurance should be about. It shouldn't be basically highly frequent risks for highly frequent events because then it just becomes too expensive. So when we look at kind of the typical weather insurance. We've seen a lot of experimentation of in kind of Africa. One, you're seeing farmers. They what they basically want the cover to be paid out for the more frequent risks. So what happened is insurance became so expensive. And when I was, when I was actually working at BFA, I still got a photo of a slip that showed that the insurance premium was about thirty percent of some insured. Clearly, that's not really insurance. I mean, that's one, <laughs> you pay it off in three years. You know, that's really not, not good value. But again, that's the benefit of the cover you're looking at, Fernando, again, some of the weather risk insurance we've seen for small-scale farmers on, on the kind of continent, where they want frequent losses covered, not necessarily the, uh, the catastrophic risks. You know, secondly, we've seen significant challenges in Africa around um, with parametric and cover, particularly around farming. So a very different kind of sector, where you've seen that basically the basis risk or the risk that the, the cover doesn't match the experience on the ground is very much out of, out of kilter. And so after about 10 years of experimentation around parametric cover for kind of small scale farmers, since they've almost given up on that route to a certain extent. You see a shift to area yield index insurance, which is more of a intensive model of collecting data, but you've now seen innovations take off in that area. And Apula is one well-known example of a company that specialized in that particular area. So again, maybe the lesson for us here, and as we're thinking about this experimentation is, you know, what is the one kind of the one way in and then see, see if there's an alternative route where you can experiment um, and um, you know, approach in a slightly different way than we were thinking of originally. We've also seen another lesson from this is where, the, where private initiatives were the, I guess, the main focus for a decade. You've seen the shift. I mean, Swiss Re have also been quite open on this around. They prefer to move to macro schemes, such as kind of government-led schemes, where you have a government as the funder to buy the co cover for a country or a region. So again, I think that will come down to what are the things to help scale up is thinking about the, the premium certainty, the certainty you get premium and get the broader cover. So it's great to see you saw um, to see how hoteliers and others were funding, but it, it becomes tricky over time, I'm guessing, around that. So again, need to think through those, how do we get those macro schemes where you're covering large areas or, or have a kind of either single buyer or you're using tax collisions to help kind of help fund it. We've also again seen in, in Africa, the African Risk Capacity Group being set up with a link to IFC. And again, there's experimentation around drought, cyclone and flood. I think it's still early days, but we're excited to see where these these things can come through. Yeah, so I guess the question is, you know, what we're seeing in Africa, we are seeing a lot of experiments around parametric, which unfortunately on the on the agriculture side didn't really work out as intended. So it shifted into a different model. And now we're seeing it being used, a parametric being used in other areas around dry, drought, cyclone, and flood with the African risk capacity kind of group. And those innovations are, are continuing. That's that's very insightful, Jeremy, in terms of how that transition. So one model that didn't work in Africa, but is looks to be a success in a different model. Um, before we move on, I wanted to ask, could you maybe expound on what the area yield model, how different is it to the parametric for those who may not understand? 
understand the, the models. Yeah, so area yield that again, this is more the agricultural space, which is basically um, what well, the question was around the weather. So parametric is, as you say, they define trigger. So if, a certain, if you reach a certain threshold, you automatically get a, get a payout. So there's a certain amount of rainfall or wind, it hits that trigger and is a payout automatically based on, on, on hitting that kind of trigger. Area yield in the certain space we're seeing is where you're basically collecting yield data from the farms that does require cross cut uh, or something sometimes crop cutting or going into more detailed assessment of, of the yield um, that the kind of the farmers are reached. So it's a much more intensive approach to kind of an index type model where you're measuring the yield rather than necessarily a defined trigger from a satellite or um, a weather base station or such like. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, and over to David Delsa. So you've worked to scale up fintech companies um, in your various roles. How might this type of solution scale um, to be widely available? Thank you, Shirley. Um, and thank you, Fernando and Jeremy. So before I jump into the actual um, question, I, I just wanted to mention that I met Fernando a few months ago in Mexico, and I, I honestly fell in love with the concept that, that ensuring something like a reef is possible and that not only it makes sort of self-contained financial sense, but it um, meaning that the amount of money that you need to ensure a particular stretch of, of, of reef is something that the reinsurer can actually pay for it. Um, but also what I, what I think is really phenomenal in this case is that the, um, the value that these reefs provide to, to everybody else, the ecosystem services that they provide. I'm not an expert, I'll let Fernando, if he, if he wants later on, get more into the details of how much that is, but it seems to be orders of magnitude bigger than, than the cost of repairing anything after there's a problem, right? So, and those ecosystem services can be applied to the hotels that still have a beach because the reef is still standing, right? But of course, also apply to the fishers, as you were saying, Shirley, before that, 25% of the fish kind of start their life or depend uh, during their lives on reefs. And if you have no more reefs, then you have no more fish to, fit, to, to catch, right? So it seems like the, the economic value of these reefs is phenomenal and, and that ensuring that value for not so much, but you know, the, the cost of the insurance is a lot less than the value. Uh, I would love Fernando also to, to weigh in on that. But all this to say that it looks from the science of it, that this innovation has, has reached the first important threshold to in order to be scaled, which is product market fit. Do you have a product that can create the impact and, and have the market happy, right? And again, if, if the cost is such that the government can afford or the government plus the hotels can afford it and it's protecting much bigger uh, ecosystem services flows, then you should say, yeah, you would probably reach product market fit. Um, well, maybe, uh, and I'll also let Fernando weigh in, typically what, what you need once you have product market fit is a, is a business model <laughs> to scale. And, and, and for a business model, you need to figure out what is the channel to your customer? What are the operations that sustain, that sustain that relationship with your customer? What is your cost base and your revenue base, right? And, and how do you put together a team, um, typically an entrepreneurial team that can create the market and can go out and, and scale you know, the revenue side? So those would be those would be the, the questions I would have. Also, the, a critical question is the, the unit economics. How is this a profitable endeavor? Is this something that would be non, you know, more on the domain of a nonprofit because it's hard to see a path to profits, uh, which then would probably limit how much you can scale because the fund. Scaling funding for nonprofits is much harder to find than scaling. And I don't know if Fernando might have some, you know, any question or any comments, sorry, on the several questions that I threw his way. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, hi, David. So I respond. Hi, nice to see you again. Um, so, in terms of we in the guide, we set up a, a space. We said, what is the economic case for or the business case for setting up an insurance? And we had to calculate the case in Mexico, in Puerto Morelos area, which is our pilot case, 
how much benefits the risk provide, like for fisheries, for tourism, and for coastal protection. We model that, we have the values of that, and they are in the millions of dollars annually. And then we need to compare that. Uh, it was like $7 million in that stretch of 20 kilometers per year. No? So how much will it cost to repair the damages? Oh, sorry, how much will you lose out of those 7 million if you are damaged? Because you don't lose everything, you lose a portion of that. Mm -hmm. So that was some models and some interviews. And then how much do, will it cost to repair those damages? And it will take time. So it will not, like, I have the money and I can repair them in one year. No, we need to wait for two, three, ten 10 years to actually recover the damages. So that was in the order of $2 million. Um, but, but to buy an insurance for that is $100,000. So definitely in order to, to, to save 2 million and also to yeah. protect 7 million of annual revenues, investing $100,000 makes a lot of sense. The challenge in our case is that, yeah, the reef managers don't have $100,000 and they are struggling to invest in water pollution, to fishing issues and this kind of things. So to tell owners for them, $100,000 is just not so much. I mean, yeah, <laughs> they, they, it's a big industry. So. They were so interested in doing that and the government of Quintana Roo also saw the economic case for that. So the interesting thing is that we pull out money, not from the environmental or conservation finance, we put money, I mean, from other sources, I mean, the, more in the economic sector, more in the tourism sector. So we tap onto those resources to actually get. So that's the important thing of, of, of this concept, in, in at least in our case. So that, that's the, the case of the business case. And you ask another question about, um, you just you mentioned that the last question was about mm -hmm. um, if it makes same. Um... I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it, it, yeah. it, I guess it wasn't as good as the first question. <laughs> yeah. But thanks a lot, Fernando. That's mm -hmm. tough, it, it, 10 times value and yeah, it, it, the, the economics seem to work. Another question is how do we scale it, right? How do we go out? No, I, I think the question is, uh, the other question was, well, the channel to scale, the vehicle rather to scale is more of a non-profit vehicle or a for-profit vehicle or a social enterprise in the middle. That would be the question now, the other, the, the type of scaling company, scale organization. What well, 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 we see and we have discussed it that having the information ready uh, for anybody to actually to access either reef insurance or eventually money insurance or it, is to have these uh, three values. So how much does it cost? What is the damage score, I mean, what, what, what could be the, what should be the trigger? If we can have a global data sets that actually provide all that information uh, and anybody can access that information, it will be so, so much easier because now we have to do pieces, piecemeal, like side by side. But that mm. information is, is available globally. So we need, it need to be improved, it need to be available uh, and that's the challenge. So anybody can, can do reef insurance Whatever. I mean, you click in, in your site, you see the risk level, you see how much money. Mm. There, are some, there should be some parameters. For example, I have two hectares of reefs, or I have 20 hectares of reefs. How much money do I need? Um, mm. So that would make things easier. So anybody could do it. So I'm wondering when and how the insurance companies are going to develop that because it's, just, it's like right now you go into the site to buy your car insurance. So you, and they ask you 25 questions about. How much do you drive? The age of your children, blah blah blah. So similar to that, we, we should be able to develop some platform or that kind of thing, asking some questions about your reef or your management, and then pop, he here is your quote. Um, so I, I do hope. I mean, I have to say this to the to the fellow, you know, the candidates and fellows that want to launch companies in the audience that this might be a very interesting role for you to play, right? The, the, the core of the idea is already proven, it's working, it's expanding. Um, we just need a faster, you know, faster vehicle to, to scale it, you know, more broadly and more rapidly. Thanks, David. Um, and I want to acknowledge, so there are questions that were put up in the chat function, but I see Fernando and others are going on responding to them. Um, there is particular one that was put up by Sim Patton. And I think it's been answered uh, when Fernando was explaining the business case and identifying what the cost would be for the damage, what the uh, how much it would uh, cost to recover, uh, and how much would be lost. Uh, so, same pattern. If um, you feel that question has not been answered, maybe you could rephrase it. Um, and then Jabu has asked, um, anyone look? Oh, sorry, anyone looking at carbon credit risk? 
can can she, he or she elaborate a little bit? I'm not sure what Jabu, that means. Jabu, do you want to step up and ask the question to elaborate? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a moment. Um, I had oh, a or may, or may, maybe I can answer that question. I think okay, I understand yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, there are some projects that actually sell carbon credits into the market, no? Um, but they're also at risk because if they don't comply with the rules, they will lose the money or there were some complications in the contracts, no? So that's the case we have in Belize now. And also about mangroves, many people are also selling credits on mangroves and they can be destroyed. So you can lose the carbon that you have stored. So there will be some contractual implications. So, so what about ensuring that risk? Um, and that's precisely what we are trying to understand because again, you don't lose all the carbon that you are stored in the mango. They will lose something and you have to do some repairs. Um, so it actually makes sense even more to ensure an asset that is already under contract uh, for carbon credits to make sure you don't lose that. So that's what we're doing in the list. We want to buy an insurance against hurricanes because if a hurricane happens here, it can have a fire later on in the next year. And you don't want to have that in the forest. That, that, that is a, in any forest, but particularly in a forest that is already has sold some carbon credits. So that's what we are doing at least so far. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Um, and I was going to ask around that same, um, on the same notion, when you're talking about ensuring forests where the conversation has moved beyond coral reefs, are there certain aspects of how the insurance product is structured that you've noted that needed need a different way of thinking or organization? Uh, are you asking me about it? Yes. Uh, well, I think in, the, in terms of the how to do it is the same steps. I mean, how much money, what are the damages to the forest? So what is the, what is the risk in reality and how the intensity of the hurricane will affect that forest? Category five may destroy everything. Category one or two, the forests are more resilient than reefs. So maybe you don't need such a lower trigger, like in the, in the reefs, we are, yeah, category two is a trigger for reefs, but maybe for forest could be category four. So understanding the risk you know, of the forest against the, the, the event is important. And then what to do about it? I mean, do we need to clear the area? Uh, in this case of Belize, we, we realize, okay, what we need to do is to prevent fires next year. But that, that's the damage, the real damage that we want to avoid. So how much will it cost to clean to, to make some no, so fire management uh, measures, no? Um, so the step is the same. What is the response? What is the protocol? And then you cost out how much it's going to cost. And then you can decide on your insurance uh, variables. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So for, Fernando, if I might, surely, are you aware of any effort that is ongoing to insure mangroves anywhere in the world that we can learn from? Uh, yes, yeah, actually, we are doing that in the Bahamas, in okay. Mexico as well, and in Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank and we already have done the analysis of the damages to mangroves, the, the process to restore the mangroves after the hurricane, and what are the steps, how much will it cost. So we already have developed that information because there is some interest in mangroves insurance. Thanks. Jeremy, Jeremy Leach, you had a Fantastic. comment? And, and sorry, Shirley, just, I was just... Okay. <laughs> I was just going to get a super quick point that Fernando, not only he's a world-class pioneer coming up with these amazing ideas to protect our natural world, but he's also very generous and he, he'll take calls from his vacation. <laughs> and he's also offered uh, in a limited basis to support whatever fellows decide to explore opportunities like this in Africa. So I think I, we couldn't think of a better teacher if you, or Sherpa if you want to use the... <laughs> that terminal to help find opportunities here. My, my pleasure. Thank you, Fernando. Go ahead, Shirley, Shirley I'll stop interrupting. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thanks, David. I think that was an important point because as we continue to work with the fellows, we are um, looking for organizations that will provide sponsorship in the sense of navig help them navigate as they develop these solutions for the betterment of their original organization or for the betterment of communities. So, Fernando, thank you so much for stepping up to that. And Jeremy Leach, um, please go ahead. You had a comment or question. Yeah, it, it part of comment, but also, uh, also a question as well. So, I mean, in the broad inclusive insurance space, not necessarily in climate risk, we see the two main challenges to take off or scale 
are around effective distribution, as in get, get to market, the sizable scale of markets. In this case, um, you know, who's going to buy the policy? How are you going to get to kind of scale? And some, uh, yeah, I guess so. Or how do you get get into the market? And the premium certainty, the certainty you get your premiums. You want to make that a certain high, higher certainty as possible. I think what's interesting in this in, is your um, your distribution is quite similar to the buyer, um, because potentially you'll be the, whether it's kind of government or your hoteliers and such like. So out, outside of that, you know, the other complexity can be managed. But can I understand, Fernando, from your side, what I hear is the you feel that the data is actually pretty good and supports parametric cover across the world, which is kind of unusual in, in, in many kind of insurance products. So you're saying that the data is there at quality and can be able to access kind of globally. What I'm um, hearing is the then the product design needs to be configured. And there's a fair bit of work around that, I'd say by, you talk about mangroves, for example, or such like. And then the complexity really comes in around twofold, as I can see it, is basically one is kind of securing who's kind of buying the premium. So I know in Mozambique trying to work out who's be willing to take up the, um, the cyclone cover on the one hand, and then two, who does the repairs? You know, who basically is then responsible for help addressing the repairs of the, of the, of the reefs? And so both those aspects need quite a bit of work to pull that together in terms of getting support from somebody to take a multi-year approach to this. So it could pay premium for several years, because we've seen a lot of experience in other parametric cover where you're going to buy it for one year and then they doesn't experience as they expect it and they fall off. My assumption here is you would want to have a multi-year kind of buyer and at the same time have the infrastructure to do the repairs in place. Is that for you where you see the two the biggest complexity around these getting these models up and running? I don't know if the biggest complexity, but definitely there are complexities. I mean, have to ensure that anybody, in our case, maybe we were quote unquote lucky in, because in the second year we bought insurance, it was a payout. So everybody was so excited. Okay, yeah, it works. And I think it's so funny. Uh, yeah, so not funny. It, it was actually um, an important uh, element to continue. So this is the fourth year that the government of Quintana Roo buys insurance because they are they are really committed to that. People is already aware of that. So that, that's an important in case so people has not and, and the price of the insurance has been dropping down. So that's an important element. We have a I would say high price because it's an area very exposed to hurricanes as you mentioned before in, in terms of um, how expensive it could be if you insure all, all three. So in terms of the response capacity Definitely, that's a challenge, and uh, because in many places they we don't tend to have that capacity in place. I mean, so we, we had to work. Uh, thanks for the free foundation support to develop these brigades that have been so successful. I mean, the great thing is that they work even if you don't have an insurance, because for any event, category one, the storm, they will you we will have damages to the reef. So it's important that you have this capacity. So I would say that in general. The financial instruments is here to support that capacity. That capacity is the most important thing to have in, in, in place in the first time. And then you have the financial instrument to support that. But it doesn't work the way around. <laughs> you definitely need the response before setting up an insurance. And so definitely it's, a, it's an important challenge. But also we have the protocol, we have the training materials, we have all that already developed. And, and so we're going to replicate the same concept in other places as I mentioned. The first thing to do in Philippines or in Solomon Islands is to actually train the brigades. Actually, we're doing that in one Micronesia as well. They, they are not going to buy insurance because they have the FEMA or the US government support, but they, they need to have this capacity to, to repair damages. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando and Jeremy. Yeah. There's some questions coming in, in the chat. Um, and I think, um, Fernando, you'd be best placed to answer the first one. Is it assumed that an insured reef, and this is from Nick Calotti or Calotti, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. It is assumed that an insured reef that is the damaged asset will then be subject to the implementation of a strict MPA during recovery. How will small scale fishers whose livelihoods are affected be compensated? So I guess from what I'm hearing from him is, do you include the wider ecosystem. So the hotel owners are covered, but what about the small scale fishers that will not be able to fish from that reef as it's been repaired or is being protected to restore it? 
Yeah, perfect. Yeah, in our case, we didn't have to restrict the fisheries or fishing activities, but in some cases they will be. So from the beginning, that will be an option is to consider, okay, the cost of repairing the damages is not just the cost of actually doing there, uh, is um, replanting the reefs and, and all the corals, but also you need to compensate that. So you may include that into the payout. So I will need $100,000 for repair the reefs, but also $50,000 to compensate the fishing, fishermen or the, the fishers, no? So you should include that. Um, but definitely we have seen that in most cases, um, the response protocol does not include restricting activities. Hmm, good question. Uh, okay, at least in the protocol that we have been working in the countries that I mentioned before, we have not seen the need to actually restrict the reef, and, sorry, the fishing in those areas. It's more important, I think, to restrict the tourism activities. If you have a lot of divers uh, or, or snorkelers, you will need to restrict that. So it's, that's more important. But anyway, you should you should consider that from the beginning. That's why the protocol defining what do you need, what is the response, is very important mm -hmm. in, in specific cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great way of thinking, Nick, in terms of involving all the different stakeholders that will be affected to create the right solutions that are suitable to the different needs. Um, so having the different parties represented. So thanks, thanks Nick, and thanks, Fernando. Um, then there's a question from Daniel Block around index insurance. So he asks why, um, uh, Jeremy, you think index insurance is a failure? Are there any potential roles a VC or startup in the natural, um, uh, is there any role for a VC or startup in natural asset protection? And if so, where? Do these insurance schemes protect natural assets or just give payouts to communities that are economically dependent on the natural assets if they are destroyed? And then not clear to me how the natural assets are themselves protected by the insurance. Jeremy, do you want to take a stab at that? On my side, I've responded in the chat to the first one, um, just so you can get a sense of that. And again, it's um, index insurance used in a broad term. We're talking about index insurance using kind of weather protection and satellite for agriculture. That's a specific kind of challenge we've seen in Africa. Uh, and you've seen a shift in area yield index insurance, which has been more reliable. But have a look at the chat. Um, on, on that front. On two and three, I'll, I'll, I'm going to let uh, uh, David um, and Fernando respond on those. I can add to it. So I, I'll, I'll let... Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Fernando, you want to go ahead? What is it, the question number two? Well, I'm happy to do number two. Maybe you do number three, because you're the real expert number three. Yeah, go ahead. So, so... I was typing something on the chat and I might have already sent it in, but I, you know, without at all being an expert on either insure tech or core reefs, it does look, however, that there is an opportunity for software or better financial services to improve the whole value chain that we're talking about here, given that the, other, the core economic value is there. Now the question is, how do we put a lot of it to work? And I do think Entrepreneurs make markets. That's their job. They make them happen. An innovative entrepreneur would create a market around their innovation. So we do believe startups have have a role to play here, um, and we're hoping to to have some startups come of this uh, blue wave that we're currently pushing forward, uh, and and that will explore further how how to go more commercial, right, and and start scaling, particularly in Africa where there's been less activity than, than in in Latin America. Um, and of course, if you have startups, well, someone has to fund them, right? So I do believe VCs, also impact investors, eco, social impact investors would have a role to play to, to help the companies, you know, get, get their proof points ready so they can then scale. So I'm, I'm bullish. <laughs> Thanks, David. So talking about the question three is, uh... There are some schemes, and I think I heard about some something in Philippines for fishers. Is actually yeah, insure the fishers, the fishing industry. No, if there is a, an event, they destroy. They have the docks, their boats, or the income affected, so they they could buy an insurance to to protect them, like they have done for farmers in many other places. Because farming is a most uh, insured entity, or oh, sorry, activity than fishing. So it's possible to do that. But maybe the information part of this is that those schemes are already there because the governments, yeah, they are aware of the poor communities and they may provide some subsidies, some sort of support to that. But no, nobody was actually providing funding for the natural assets. 
So that's why this is an innovation. But you can combine them. And precisely the project that we are working with the Asian Development Bank in Asia Pacific, as I mentioned, they are concerned about how to do that. They may need to be two different insurances or two triggers because the risk level of the reef is one, let's say category three hurricane, but the communities may need funding for different categories. So you may think that there are different assets that are going to be insured, let's say assets in the community or the reef. And so you, you may need different schemes for that. But that's the thinking that we have now. If we want to combine the social aspects and the natural assets. Thank you, Fernando. Um, I see also Jeremy went on to expound the question around VCs and other funders coming to play. And it reminded me of a quote that I left it from, um, I think Christine of the TNC um, during the FinTech Resilience Summit. And she was speaking to various VCs or investors and talking about how they should step out of the risk curve in the near term, which will end up paying off in the long term because they're investing in making communities resilient and they need for their businesses to be resilient in the long term. Um, so um, the space is uncertain, but we definitely urge investors um, and VCs to come and play their role in supporting some of these initiatives that will take, they may take um, a bit longer in the, uh, in the beginning to scale but eventually they will pay off so it's about the risk look having that long-term view been interesting from your group yeah sure no we had a, a good debate at a different level and also came up with a potential idea for for work as well um so one there was big questions around how do you predict the models uh work in regard to climate change so we're seeing that kind of you know the climate change impacting um the the, the market you know and saying how do we how do we consider for climate change and pricing. I think we were also kind of had a discussion that you can basically obviously, all insurance has a massive uncertainty yield, uh, um, uncertainty threshold. So again, that's typically priced into it. But again, we need to think through how is that managed over time? Um, again, also discussions around how do we manage the, um, how much you self-insure rather than kind of insure. I think one of the questions also came up is around the issue, a whole issue is the tragedy of the commons. You know, so again, how much of this also is, how much is it a social venture or really a profitable venture? Again, not somewhat linked into that in terms of, of that whole debate around, it's not our problem, um, such like. And then the last part of discussion was really around um, applying it to Africa yeah. and saying, you know, the one <laughs> comment that's repetitive in pretty much every market I've looked at and as particularly outside of South Africa is that, uh, to quote a friend from Benin, insurance is seen as a tax that you pay and don't get anything back. And again, that's more retail oriented insurance. But again, there is that whole kind of negative uh, view of insurance more broadly uh, and how it's designed and how trustworthy it is and how reliable it is. So again, we need to think through that in terms of the TB, the African market, because that's been a big impediment elsewhere. And then the last one, a nice kind of suggestion for, from, jo um, from Joseph around, you know, one of the biggest challenges around is for fishermen about around um, the amount of fish they're getting and the risk of disappearing stock or having some certainty around um, uh, the yield. So can you potentially come up with a, a yield, or sorry, uh, a yield index for fish stock so that that would allow, be allowed, allow uh, fishermen to smooth their yield over time? So again, you know, relating to a particular challenge, for example, around Lake Victoria, where fishermen are particularly impacted when there's a lower yield than, than normal. So again, nice to just discussion around um, that area as well. Sounds like a really interesting discussion. Thank you for putting us ahead in terms of ideas that we could explore. Uh, let me open up the floor to David to summarize what the key insights coming out of his group. So, so we, we discussed as well uh, the opportunity for Africa. We actually started with that because um, we had Ricardo who's from Mozambique and he was talking about how the length of the coast in that country, which is very long and all the opportunities there for, for mangrove and reef protection. Um, we also, we heard from Elodie from Swiss Reef Foundation uh, about a few examples and she brought the very interesting point that in some parts of Africa, there you may not be able to find the large hotel that Fernando was talking about. Because the, the Maya Riviera, that's a, that's a very well developed in terms of tourism, very well developed area, but maybe some parts of Mozambique just don't have the same, the same big hotel. Mm -hmm. So then the, what, what is the role of the private sector that's a lot smaller 
uh, instead of that, instead of hotels, you may find smallholder farmers uh, or small scale fishers. So how can they uh, be good stewards of the of the natural asset and then still be supported by by insurance? So I think there were a number of, of um, good points there. And then finally, we were also discussing that some of these um, deals in the pipeline are taking a little while to take off. It was particularly interesting to hear that the, the insurers, um, the, the private sector from the insurance side was actually very keen to explore this and that LOD thought this was gonna actually grow very quickly because of that. But then the organizing the local actors is taking longer than, than you would have imagined. And that will be a very interesting thing to dig deeper in, in, in the future. Why is that? And are there mechanisms to, to make them make that coalescing of the state, local stakeholders happen faster? Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, and yeah, that perspective around, uh, so you may think you have hotels everywhere, but what about places that are not as developed? How do you yeah. protect that as well? So thanks so much. Fernando? So do I do the summary? Yes. <laughs> well, <I'm> surprised. <clears throat> okay, we discussed about the implications of this, for example, of the insurance providing funding to certain activities that may, for example, create conflicts between the different users of the reef, like fishermen, tourism, and conservation. <clears throat> so my point is, yeah, the conflicts are already there. The insurance may exacerbate them or not, but the, the role of the insurance is not, the role is has to be arranged, dealing with the arrangements in, setting that the area may have. No? So that's, that's an important thing. Then also corruption happens everywhere. And, and again, you have to deal with corruption. In the case of Mexico, we develop some mechanisms to avoid that, even though they are cumbersome, they complicated things, but they were needed in order to gain the trust from the communities and, and the hotel owners and the government. The third issue was um, <clears throat> uh, how, how the hotel owners are actually paying for the insurance if they are, in the case of Mexico, they are paying fees like in many other places, but they go to central funding system, which not necessarily goes to, pay, to buy the insurance. So that's things that need to be uh, streamlined and, and clarified in our case and in other countries as well, like, like South Africa. No? And I think finally those were the main issues that actually there's issues that already happen in, in the places that we may think to work. Uh, but we need to consider them by the time we design insurance and we design particularly the institutional arrangement, as I call, uh, that's going to manage all these different aspects of uh, funding. No? Ah, and, and another important aspect is how to involve the communities, <clears throat> either fishermen or tool operators in the process. Uh, and I, my answer is that to intervene in the reefs, you need permits. I mean, this is very regulated aspect in most countries you know so only a few entities may have those permits uh, and they may be able to obtain them but they can hire the communities uh, community members the way we are doing here in mexico the brigades are actually tour operators fishermen uh, local people from the community interested in supporting the reef etc no? <clears throat> so from the beginning the response capacity needs to involve communities but the people who are going to lead the process is very few they have to have the permits to do it. Do you think there's an adequate number of contractors who are able to perform environmental maintenance or repair services in the African market? I really don't have an idea about the African market. Sorry to, to answer. Maybe somebody else can, can say that. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. What was the Mexican experience? Do you have to train everybody? Were people ready? What was, what was the minimum requirement for you to be able to be trained? Can you illuminate in, in Mexico? The entities who actually can lead the process, they were like five, six, but that's more than enough for our marketing in every case. In terms of people, we have, given that there's a lot of uh, tourism industry here, it was similar in Belize and Honduras. We have a lot of divers who are qualified because we use ma dive masters in, in most of the cases for mm -hmm. the uh, brigades and they enough. That's a key question we are asking also in the, when now we are going to replicate that in Philippines, Indonesia, and Fiji, then some places they say, well, we have very few, maybe we have to adapt the standards uh, to the local conditions. Like if there is no certified divers, like in Solomon Islands, mm -hmm. There are not, I mean, very few. And, and mm -hmm. those five are going to be very busy doing something else. 
So maybe mm. we need to change our requirements in terms of the people who can die. In terms of the entities who, who do that, I mean, that will be re re really a requirement to decide if uh, it's feasible to do this project in, a, in, a, in an area. Somebody has to be able to do it. Mm. And it's not easy to create a new institution to do that. So that will narrow down, but maybe not so much, uh, I would say, because generally you have an important reef that you want to protect. Somebody else is already working there. Mm -hmm. mm. We were also having our brainstorming on the side and we were thinking that perhaps this is an area that a tech founder could come in and solve for in the sense that the same way insurance companies have like certified body shops, they could sort of form certified repairers or have um, provide standards or be trained by TNC to ensure that the standards for evaluating the repairs um, are done well. So as you scale, you'll need more players in the markets uh, to establish, uh, to, to do the repairs, certify the repairs. And these are angles or ways that tech founders could come into play, similar to what um, Jeremy's group proposed around certainty around fish yield and all that. So we are at the top of the hour. I just wanna say thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. You all made it very interesting for the questions that we've been receiving on the chat. Thank you all so much for being so engaged. If we haven't responded to your questions, uh, uh, please join our community um, and we can respond to them on Circle. Uh,